Hannah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's um, a great honor to be invited. And before we hit the hit the record button, we were both talking about mom life, and you have a newborn. How, how's that going for you? Uh, it's going really well, um, but I haven't been on a bike since she was born, so it's twelve weeks now. Um, well, longer than twelve weeks without cycling, which is probably the longest stretch that I can remember. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting back into that soon. Um, but yeah, she's um, she's she's fantastic. I've been loving every minute, so it's great. Did you always want to have kids, or was this something new that kind of came up in your life? Um, yeah, I'm, yes, yes, we did. Um, but, um, we, um, my partner and I have both been quite busy, um, for the last however many years, um, writing this book, changing jobs, um, going to live in France for a bit. So, um, yeah, this is a, this is a good point to, to have a baby. Yeah, this um, is something but yeah, that... always slightly. Sorry, I was always slightly apprehensive as well about how um, a baby fits in with um, a lifestyle where we're doing a lot of cycling and a lot of traveling and cycling. But now I'm excited about how um, we can do that with her um, at some point and looking at kind of cargo bikes and um, co-pilots and all of that stuff. Yeah, and like as a feminist, did you think about what having a a kid meant to you and you know what that means and then also when you had a daughter what what were the thoughts behind that um gosh that's that's um that's a big question um yes definitely um certainly um because from um sort of casual observation it seems that um uh just looking at cycling as an activity um in this instance but um it would tend to be women that will give that up um or certainly for 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 a longer period than their partners will um and their partners tend to find it easier to go back to it and find time for it um so i'm yeah there's there's all of that trying to make it um uh as equal as possible is yeah definitely what I am hoping to aspire to. Um, yes. Yeah, it's been. <laughs> there's, a, so, there's so much in that. that <laughs> there's, there, there is so much. Um, and we could this talk is some... probably all, all, all the session about that, really. Yeah, like things that I thought about um, were, you know, women, only women can have babies. So that is a really powerful thing. And that's awesome. Um, but then there's also like, the part where as a woman you want to be treated as an equal to a man and you want to have equal opportunity um and you also um i'm I'm trying to think of a good way to say this like not everybody wants to um just be a mom and for the people that are quote just moms there's nothing wrong with that and you can still be a feminist and be a stay-at-home mom and you're not you know but then it's just it's just a difficult conversation and i'm not doing a very good job um saying what I'm trying to say but yeah just there's just a lot of thoughts that go around that and what does it mean and whenever you have a daughter um how do how to raise a daughter so that she sees herself like she isn't putting limited um thoughts and 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 things on what she can do in her life so there's just like a lot that goes into like you said we could record a whole podcast on that yeah and certainly that's kind of really um in a in a way what the book's about it's 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 trying to show that um that there are these amazing cycling stories um for all these women that had generally been quite overlooked in the culture and history of cycling and so it's yeah i would hope that um for my daughter and her generation that um they will certainly see cycling as something that is absolutely belongs to to women as much as men um like so many activities um and that you know it's it's it is changing and it's but it's taken a long time um and it's kind of extraordinary that you know we're still having to talk about these things um and that yeah as i said that was kind of one of the sort of big motivations for writing this book is is to kind of help make these stories more um part of the mainstream 
history of cycling. So I found that um, a lot of certainly books about cycling, um, general books about cycling, there'd be, they, you know, they would cover women's history, but it would tend to be quite of a, a side note to, to cycling history. And I think that's kind of representative in a way of women's cycling, women cycling in general, um, in, you know, whether it's in the sport or just generally, it just, it, do they just tend to be, women have tended to be quite sidelined. Um, and it's interesting you're talking about motherhood as well, because I am um, in, in, um, towards the end of the book, I talked to um, Lizzie Danen, who's an Olympic cyclist. Um, she just won La Course, um, it, which is the women's race of the Tour de France. Um, and she's a mother. And there are, we actually, I talked to her in the book about being a mother and a professional cyclist, because there are so few professional women cyclists who are also mothers. Um, because it's a very difficult um, uh, that you know again this is kind of you know it's a, it's a complicated issue but um, there is something that's stopping <coughs> women in the sport being able to have children and come back um, and part of that is because generally they earn so much less than men do um, and also they have to take out um, you know take a big chunk of time out of their um career and it's very difficult to come back from that so um yeah it's it's um it's it's an issue which kind of permeates kind of all areas of um the the sport yeah i think that being an empowered woman whether you're choosing to continue working you know when you have kids or choosing to you know be there all the time for your kids, which is absolutely amazing as a, as a stay at home mom, but having the choice and being respected for your choice, I think is part of what it means to be a feminist. And yeah, I think that, and we'll, we'll definitely get into some of the, the stories in the book, which is incredible. Um, but myself, you know, as a professional cyclist who got pregnant, had a baby and, you know, there's no racing in North America or in, I guess in Canada. I can't, I can't leave Canada because the border's closed, but there's no racing that I can do um, as my, f- as a comeback. And I was planning to come back to racing after three months after having my son. And I think that a big part of women retiring or choosing to have a baby at the very end of their cycling career is, is a twofold thing. It's number one, there is a lack of support in the bike industry, which is improving but, you know, some, as somebody that negotiates all my own partnerships, I can, I can say that it is very difficult when you're pregnant and even when you have a baby to be negotiating sponsorships. And then on the other end, um, yeah, you, have to, you, you, ha- you can't train like you were training before when you are pregnant and whenever you have a baby. And then you also have to have – it's not just the sponsorships. You have to have support in your family, and you also have to be willing to um, – have childcare so that you can go out and train. And something that helped me reconcile that was, yeah, like I'm, my job is to ride my bike. There could be a woman who's a lawyer and her job is to be a lawyer. So how is that any different? But for some reason, because cycling is like people, it's a, it's a, it's a passionate um, job. Like people don't start, um, you know, cycling cause they're not passionate about it and they become professionals probably because they're pretty passionate about it. But for some people it looks as a hobby and then some people will label you as selfish, even yeah. though, you know, you're not doing like a traditional job. So it's just a really interesting narrative. And I think it's really important to be having these conversations and just talking about what it all means, even though sometimes it's really hard to articulate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I think um, there's a little bit in some ways about women and um, having children and professional sport. It goes back a little bit to um, the sort of ideas that the wrong ideas that people had, um, you know, over a century ago that, you know, about women's biology and their um, <laughs> their capacity to, to do sport. And I think um, when you have a baby, it's kind of assumed that that kind of, a little bit that that aspect of your life is is over um that you you're not capable anymore a, a little bit i think um and or maybe that yeah like you say you, you know that that maybe there's this idea that um you shouldn't be continuing with this 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 particular career path that as a mother it's it's not it's not suitable or um the right thing to be doing 
Um, so there's just, there's so many kind of complex things going on, I think, around um, mothers and sports. So in your book, and you not have... to mention, you say the lack of the complete lack of support within the industry. Um, well, not complete, but you know that you know there has been a historically very little support for women and um, who are planning to become mothers or who are mothers um, and want to continue being professional athletes. Yeah, so let's talk about um, some of the things that were said to women in like the 1890s, early 1900s across the world about why women shouldn't ride bikes. Because I, I found some of those um, things that doctors said or, or men said to be really comical. But whenever women were, you know, during that time, it wasn't co as comical because that was kind of the zeitgeist. What are some of the things that were said to women? Um, they were so um, wide and varied, and like you say, they do kind of come across as, as quite comical um, at times, um, although actually, if you were there um, and being told these things, it probably um, was less so, although many women just ignored them and, and knew that they were kind of baseless. Um, but one of the, um, one of the um, sort of the strongest kind of argument, well, not arguments, but ideas um, that, that gained kind of currency was this idea that it would impact on your um, fertility um, and you wouldn't be able to. So if you if you rode a bicycle, if you sat in a bike bicycle saddle, you would then impair yourself and you would not be able to have children. You would damage yourself um, because there was, at that time, women's place was generally... Or particularly if you're a middle more upper class woman your place was in the home it was to get married it was to have a family um you didn't work if you didn't have to if you financially didn't have to um and so this idea that um you would imperil that was quite um shocking to a lot of people um but by saying these things it was a way of trying to stop people stop women from going out and riding bicycles um, and so there was a certain what I see as a kind of sort of moral panic around this idea of um, women riding bicycles. And it's hard to say now whether these doctors really believed it or whether they sort of were part of this, um, the kind of this, what was then this patriarchal idea that women shouldn't be going out to ride bicycles because in doing so, they were finding a certain sense of independence and freedom. And as I said, their, their lives were generally quite domestic and contained. And the bicycle was kind of the exact opposite of that. It represented this a freedom and an ability to be independent and go to places um, and have fun and pleasure. Um, but they were trying to conflate that with something that was kind of not nice um there was and then in the extreme end um what they would say some doctors and well moral kind of commentators um would say that actually the the act of riding a bicycle would be your moral downfall which essentially they were saying that you would become um a prostitute or kind of sexually um promiscuous just because you sat in a bicycle saddle um, and I see this, I've seen this now in, um, it's sort of this idea hasn't quite gone away, um, in more kind of culturally conservative countries. Um, um, in the book I talk about Afghanistan and Iran, um, and there's this idea there still that this kind of, you know, to be, to be a woman on a bicycle, you're sort of endangering your, um, your respectability um you're endangering your it's a slippery slope essentially and it's still kind of this idea of sitting on a saddle is still kind of conflated with um sexuality um and one of the funniest stories back going back to the 1890s was that um some bicycle manufacturers then sort of leapt onto this idea of um this moral panic about women sitting on bicycle saddles and what it could do to them and they started creating different types of saddles not to make women more comfortable which is you know what bicycle manufacturers are 
trying to do now for women's cyclists um but to essentially they would say they were non-stimulating they wouldn't make women um they wouldn't excite women sexually um which is kind of it's extraordinary i mean they wouldn't say it in so many words but that's essentially the subtext of 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 these products that they were marketing which is kind of extraordinary really um you know it was that much of a concern that that bicycle manufacturers would actually make a product um in order to counter this absolutely ridiculous um idea um <laughs> Um, but yes, it didn't just stop with the reprodu reproductive organs, you know, it was, it would make you go mad, um, you know, women in cycling, it could make you crazy, it could cause, um, there were, there were things that they, um, said that applied to men as well. There was one of the, um, kind of perhaps most famous things, bicycle face, um, which is essentially, um, the idea that, um, your face would be stuck in a certain kind of position because it was so used to this position that you put it in when you when you pedaled that that you'd be stuck like that forever which is kind of again absolutely ridiculous but they you know this applied to men as well but i think it's the, the sort of where it really kind of um uh where they really sort of focus in on women was around um sexuality um and reproduction yeah it's just really interesting um yeah. to think about that and to think about like where did they come up with that thought process and i'm trying to be um you know fair about trying to understand where those male doctors or male you know quote experts came up with these these ideas and d did you learn any more about that like where those ideas actually came from and how they back those up um i don't think there was <laughs> <laughs> there was much to back any of this up. I mean, doctors then were a very different kind of thing to how they are today. Um, I'm not sure the medical education, I mean, was quite as um, rigorous and, and scientific as it is today. Um, so I think it was personal opinion and personal prejudice. Um, there were, I mean, I do make it... Um, uh, point out in the book and make it clear that there were actually doctors who had a totally different perspective on all this and they promoted cycling to their their female patients and actually um the ones that i talk about um they really recommended cycling um because at this time um there were um women's mental health was um a particular you know was a focus and and what 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 they called neurasthenics so women who'd had um depression and and mental breakdowns um which were generally treated in kind of um different and and some i talk about how there was a way of treating women with depression um, by using something called a rest cure, where women were basically confined to bed um, for weeks or even months on end, they 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 did this to men as well, um, but like but mostly it was to women. It was the idea again, this idea that women were too, are too frail um, and need to be kind of protected, and um, their you know their best way to keep themselves um, safe and healthy is to do as little as possible, which again is, is, is really about control. Um, but many doctors completely rejected that. Um, and they actually prescribed cycling to their patients. Um, and I mentioned a couple of cases in the book where the women who had been told to cycle said, their lives were, they lied, their health was completely transformed by going out cycling. Um, and they felt so much better than they had done in years. Um, and their mysterious pains went away. And, um, and that's something that we can understand completely now when we know, um, how, um, absolute the link between, um, exercise and, and mental health is, um, that that's kind of irrefutable now, but, but some doctors were, realizing that at that time and also they were probably realizing that women's lives generally were fairly confined and narrow and not conducive to good mental health and getting women out um well encouraging women to go out and take exercise and 
and have more independence and um, all these things that the, that come with riding a bicycle was actually going to be a really great thing for women. Can we talk about the evolution of the bicycle? I, I thought it was really cool to learn about that in your book and then also like the evolution of women's clothing. <laughs> I told my friends that I was reading this book and I was, t- I was talking about, you know, what cycling was like in the 1890s and the 1900s. And my friend said, well, women can't ride a bike side saddle. You know, how, how did that all work? So yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to hear about the evolution of bicycle design and also women's um, clothing and, and the, the pushback against that as well. Um, I'm just going to switch the light on because I'm where it's getting really dark in here. You probably can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So, um, there were so the um the bicycle um that kind of really changed everything was the safety bicycle and that was um invented in the 1880s and that's the bicycle that most resembles the bikes that we um ride today but before this um i'm sure many people will have seen pictures of um what in north america you call the high wheel um and in the uk we call it penny farthing it's the it's that strange bicycle with the app absolutely enormous front wheel and the the very tiny little wheel at the back. I mean, it looks just absolutely absurd. Um, That was, despite it's looking completely unrideable um, and highly dangerous, which it was, um, was hugely popular. Um, So before the safety bicycle was invented, um, that, so just preceding that, this was the bicycle that, that dominated cycling um there had been bicycles before that um they all had their their kind of drawbacks um and generally weren't quite so um um they didn't quite have the same success as the high wheel um so when the high wheel was invented it 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 really did seem to kind of capture a moment and Suddenly there were cycling clubs and bicycle races. There have been bicycle races before as well. Um, but it, 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 it really seemed to kind of um, this two wheel, this desire to create a perfect two wheel machine was kind of really kind of uh, kind of get, gathering ground then. Um, but one of the one of the issues with the high wheel, um, apart from the fact that it was pretty dangerous and 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 not really very kind of user friendly was that women couldn't ride them because how could you get on top of this huge thing if you are wearing long great skirts and petticoats which pretty much every woman was because that was the outfit that you were expected to wear it was kind of the outfit that was was fashionable but also to not wear, to wear, you know, women did not wear trousers at this time. And if you did, you were kind of, you would have been treated as an outcast completely um, or a kind of very freak, a freak, basically. Um, so women were excluded from cycling. Um, and and then in the 1880s, um, the safety bicycle came along. So two wheels, the same size. Um, it has... Um, it was vastly user friendly compared to all the other um, bicycles that come before it. Um, it was a lot lighter. You could actually stop it. Um, it was had a chain. <laughs> it was um, had a chain, so um, it had pedals as opposed to um, a, pr- a previous model where you'd had to run along the ground with, with your bicycle. Um, and in a few years after the safety was invented, um, bicycle manufacturers realized that um, they could sell more bicycles if they could get more women to ride them. Um, and women were riding the new bicycles, but not in huge numbers. But then they came out with a women specific design. Um, so in around 1887, I think it was, um, the first women specific bicycle came out with a um, with a drop bar, the, the crossbar was was dropped, like women's specific bicycles today, um, so that when you were wearing long skirts and petticoats, you could easily just step over, and the chain had a chain guard over it, so your um, 
so the fabric wouldn't get caught. Um, and this was a huge game changer. And it wasn't um, long before around a third of the bicycle market in the UK and North America was women, um, which considering it's around that figure today, um, it hasn't actually gone up that much, is, is quite amazing. Um, and it just shows that there were so many women who were didn't care what those doctors that we were talking about said um, because the um, benefits of being able to go out and cycle um, were so huge. Um, and it's also worth um, remembering that at this point, sports, women in sports was almost non-existent, um, partly again because, as we said, the, the clothing made it so difficult. Um, it's an... Um, you know, sport was something that men did. It wasn't, women weren't encouraged to do it. Um, so um, bicycling um, became a hugely popular, popular activity for women. And so, you, you know, completely understandably because they wanted to um, go out, you know, this is the opportunity to actually go out and do something physical and be a bit more independent. Um, and there were women who then, realized that well not realized that i think they knew but they took the bicycle as this opportunity to adapt their dress um to make it safer to ride bicycles um and so this outfit um that they wore was called rational dress um um and it mo it tended to consist of bloomers which were trousers or pantaloons that went just below the knee um, and a jacket. And at this point, that would have been really quite controversial. Women had tried to wear trousers previously. There had been movements where women had tried to introduce rational dress just in society in general, because they argued quite rightly that women's Victor Victorian women's outfits were so um, cumbersome um, that they were just, they were dangerous and they were actually stopping them being able to lead ordinary lives um, and just be able to, you know, if you think, if you try and imagine how doing your, just your ordinary day, but you're, you're kind of swathed in meters and meters of fabric that you're tripping on, um, it's getting caught around your ankles, getting caught in the wheels of carts that are passing you or potentially, or actually also a huge fire hazard. Um, they were then, um, that was a big risk that sparks from fires um, could catch on your copious amounts of fabric and you could go up in flames. Um, so women for years had been trying to change their clothes, but they had generally always been um, sort of, um, had a lot of pushback um, and it never really kind of gained much traction. But the bicycle gave women um, more of a reason um, to be able to change their outfits. So although it wasn't accepted um, generally, um, there was certainly more of an understanding that, OK, you're on a bicycle and it probably is kind of safer. Um, and for instance, in France, um, it was written into law that women weren't allowed to wear trousers, but they actually changed it in the 1890s to say women could wear trousers if they were riding a bicycle or on a horse, um, which is kind of extraordinary um, that the bicycle could lead to an actual change in the law for women's dress. Um, and actually, I don't think that was changed for... <laughs> Till actually quite recently, although obviously French women didn't pay any attention to it. Um, so yeah, the bicycle has so many has had kind of a kind of really sort of far-reaching um, influence on the kind of women's transition and move towards um, certainly a move towards kind of greater freedoms and emancipation that came in the 20th century. Um, and 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 certainly that can be symbolised in some way by um, the clothing that many of them chose to wear. Yeah, and I would love to hear more about how the bike is a tool for social justice and how the suffragettes use bicycles. Um, 
voting is something that is on top of mind for many people right now with the U.S. election impending. And there are many people who have the right to vote but don't exercise their right. And it's easy to take for granted that you're just born with this right to vote. But there are women before us and, and who couldn't vote and had to go through extreme measures in order to fight for our rights. So before before we talk about um, you know using the bike for social justice, I just want to encourage everybody out there to exercise your right to vote because it's it's really important to, to do that. Um, and I, I had an experience where it wasn't like a crazy experience, but I moved to Canada year, some years ago and I'm a resident of Canada, but I'm not yet a citizen. And I thought that I was allowed to go vote in the local election because I got something saying like residents of BC, you know, British Columbia, here's where the voting is. So I went to go vote and the lady who, in charge of the voting, I told her like, Hey, I'm here to vote. And I told her, but I'm not a citizen. And she was absolutely horrified that I was there trying to vote. And I was basically like thrown out. And I thought, oh my gosh, like this is what a fraction of what it would feel like to be a, a disenfranchised person. So just thinking about the, 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 the rights and the things that we have are a, an absolute privilege and we should use those. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that was my Absolutely. little diatribe. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Here, here. Um, it's been really interesting to see how um, the bicycle has been used in some of the Black Lives Matter um, protests that have been going on in the States. And also um, there's been a little bit of that here as well. And it's um, it's 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 really amazing to see, um, particularly, as you say, that um, the bicycle has been used um, previously for um, fighting for social justice. Um, and in my book, I look at the suffragettes in the UK um, who were fighting for the vote, um, which um, we didn't get till 1918. Um, and the suffragettes, um, the suffragette organisation was the Women's Social and Political Union. Um, and it was run by the Pankhurst the family. Um, so um, Emmeline, Sylvia and Christabel. So Emmeline was their mother. Um, and she founded the organization. Um, and it's, they um, actually, their members um, use the bicycle a lot. Um, so firstly, um, in order to spread the word about votes for women. Um, so they, um, so various members would um, spend their weekends um, cycling around, because um, bear in mind, this is before most people had car, you know, it would be very rare to have, unusual to have a car, public transport was limited. Um, and so they used their bicycles in order to go and visit um, women in towns and villages um, near to where they lived. Um, and they would sometimes turn up um, in a group um, and they would have the flags, literature to give out. So they would turn up in the village, park up on the, the village green. Um, one of them would start talking um, about the movements and why it was so important for women to get the vote. Um, and they would do this all around the region um, and this was particularly effective in regions where it was really hard to get to. You know, there were villages and and that 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 just wouldn't have heard so much about um, the the idea of women getting the vote or why it was so important. Um, and the bicycle was that was this amazing tool in order to be able to communicate this message um, and. Uh, I talk in the book about one women, woman member from um, Leicester, um, Alice Hawkins, who was particularly famous for the work that she did um, cycling around her region um, and getting women um, signed up and, mem and joining the organisation. Um, she was extremely successful at it um, and she also just loved cycling she was a member of her local cycling club so it's a kind of she can manage to combine the two activities so a sunday cycle um whilst also um spreading the word about um something that was so important to her um she also got imprisoned for um taking part in protests in london um uh, the suffragettes um 
they were um, they were often um, imprisoned um, for activities like setting light to empty buildings um, that belonged to prominent politicians or smashing the windows of MPs. Um, and again, um, some of their members would often use the bicycle as their getaway vehicle, um, which kind of makes sense. Um, and it's quite funny to think of now. I talk in the book about two women who um, made a plan to set light to a large unoccupied house that was owned by um, a British politician. Um, and they rode up on their bicycles in the dead of night um, with all their arson equipment in their front bicycle bicycle baskets um, and then sped away afterwards um, but they were um, seen by a policeman who stopped them not because he thought that they'd set light to a house but because they weren't they didn't have any lights on their bicycles um, so they got a telling off but actually they were um, they were tracked down and 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 ended up in prison for what they'd done um, not long after um, but yes it it, it for this for the suffragettes it was the bicycle was quite a um sort of linchpin of their of their organization and uh, as i mentioned the founders of the organization christabel pankhurst and um sylvia pankhurst they've been really enthusiastic cyclists in their teens um they'd belong to a local cycling club in manchester um so they although they gave up cycling as far as i can see when they got so kind of too busy with um their their work for the wspu um i like to think that cycling kind of um was it one of their sort of foundational um uh a foundational part of the um that suffragette movement yeah and you mentioned the black lives matter movement and in your book you have a statistic from 2019 um, from San Francisco, showing that 13% of cyclists in the city are women of color, with Asian and Hispanic women being the least represented, um, and that many of these people don't ride bikes because they don't see other women like them. And this is just another um, thread in the narrative of how important it is to have diversity, representation, and opportunity, um, not only just to ride the bikes, but in, in roles of power and influence um, not only in our industry of cycling, but across everything. Um, what other things did you learn about the lack of diversity in history and the, how that's affected cycling specifically? Um, well, in the whole of the history of cycling for women, it's been a story of, um, of exclusion and marginalization. Um, and it's still going on um which you know as you said you you mentioned that statistic but also um the fact that you know in the professional sport um women there are less women's races they are less high, high profile than the men's um women get paid there's a huge pay gender pay gap in women's professional cycling um that's all still very much a thing um which is very shocking um and um yes i mean as i said before you know the reason i wanted to write this book was to make to to bring these women's stories to the forefront because that's what i felt was had been missing from the history of the sport um and that you know um it's just so generally quite white male dominated um and you just have to look at um most books on cycling most bicycle races and you'll see you know the demographic is 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 not very it's not very diverse um and um the you know this is just um a sort of you know a problem that it has been kind of you know like we talked about you know how women were kind of actively you know people tried to actively stop women from cycling um when the bicycle was invented and it's sort of you know from then on it's just you know being kind of a sort of constant um 
lack of inclusivity um and you know i think that's kind of image has been what has stopped people from wanting to feeling like that they belong that this is something for them um that's you know this is you know cycling's not you know i don't see people like myself so it can't be for me um and i think that that's definitely what what the the um what cycling and you know, and many others are society we're still struggling with. Yeah. Yeah. And another interesting thing was about how, like, in com- uh, countries like Afghanistan and Iran, and then you talk about Saudi Arabia as well, how even now, like, cycling is not considered an acceptable thing for women to do. And you also talked about Shannon, I think her last name's Galpin, right? Shannon Galpin's work in Afghanistan. Can you just talk about the the state of cycling currently in these countries? Yeah, so um, Saudi Arabia is, is quite interesting um, because it was actually illegal for women's cycle um, until I think it was, it was 2013. It was before women could drive, they were allowed to bicycle, um, but only just. Um, there and but what's um i think particularly fascinating is that although it's it's women are allowed legally allowed to cycle in saudi arabia now um what the there's actually some a small print that says but they're not allowed to use the bicycle to actually go anywhere um i mean yeah it's 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 really strange um so you can cycle around a park essentially um but you couldn't cycle I think the idea is that, I mean, it sort of goes back again to um, what we were talking about with um, cycling in in kind of the Western world in the 1890s during that kind of cycling craze is the idea that people, the patriarchy didn't want women to use it to find independence to go to places. Um, that's what worried them. And I think in Saudi Arabia where um, it's fairly well known that women don't have much freedom of movement they don't have um control over passports and travel generally um it's like it's so you know the um the guardianship um model where most women have to ask permission um from a male member of their family in order to 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 do many things um and the idea of a woman getting on a bicycle um is doesn't fit into that um unfortunately but um actually cycling is getting bigger and bigger in the country um now it's particularly now it's it's legal even if there is this bizarre um caveat about not going anywhere on a bicycle um so i spoke to um a few women who were part of um who'd founded groups for women to go out and cycle and um they have become incredibly popular. Um, so one of the women I spoke to had had she'd spent time in a lot. She spends a lot of time in Europe as well, and she'd done a bicycle race um, in in Europe, and she talked about it on social media. And I think someone had in, uh, one of um, a paper had interviewed her, and she was inundated with messages from women in her country saying, um, "I would love to do that." Um, so she set up a women's cycling group. Um, and they go out um, every week, I think. Um, and um, they, she, you know, they teach people to cycle. Um, and then I spoke to someone else who um, is doing something very similar as well. Um, and I think there are little um, groups popping up um, around the country um, where women are doing the same and supporting each other and teaching each other. Um, and it's 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 really kind of amazing and inspiring. Um, and then if, in Afghanistan, um, I spoke to um, someone called Zakia who lives in a region called Bamiyan, um, and she had set up a well. She had started cycling because she needed to get to college, um, and she the buses had been stopped and it was too far to walk and the boys were cycling. And so she thought, well, I can cycle. So I'm just going to cycle. And she did. Um, but, um, initially she got a huge amount of, um, 
criticism from um, particularly the the kind of religious community, the mullahs um, in where she lived, um, who in some cases it got quite extreme where they talked about, um, you know, they even use words like, um, you know, stoning her um, for her, for her, you know, for, for doing something that was deemed as so controversial for a woman. Um, but she is a, a, incredible and she just ignored them and carried on. Um, and she actually went to, um, um, uh, I think, sort of her local government officials and she got their support for what she was doing. Um, and then a, another girl in the region saw her cycling and thought, I want to join you. And it and it went from there. Um, and then they set up a team. They did the first their first ever bike race. Um, and yeah, it's they're really kind of um, changing perceptions around what women can do in their region. Um, and incredibly brave, I think, um, really. Um, I'm not sure um, many of us would have stood up to 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 that kind of um uh i was gonna say criticism but actually that's too um that's like it's it's much yeah exactly oppression and also potential violence um um it's you know i what she told me i thought it was it was it was terrifying what she'd she'd had to endure but she was um so determined to continue and um you know do something she enjoyed and was also um, helping her get an education. Um, so she, yeah, her story was incredibly inspiring, and and the um, I know that the that it's still very going strong, and they're still doing it. And there's also a national team in the um, capital Kabul, um, which is separate. But but I think women's cycling is it's 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 becoming more established in the country, whereas it been almost non-existent before. Um, and Shannon Galpin, um, who is from um, Colorado, she has um, did amazing work with the Afghan National Women's Cycling Team. Um, and uh, she has worked on different um, inspiring projects around the country, um, helping women um, <clears throat> do more with bicycles. Um, and yes, she was yeah, incredible to talk to um, and hear about her experiences. Um, really inspiring. Yeah, that definitely pulls together the seeing women like me doing, you know, what we talked about with the the diversity and in San Francisco, like the main reason why people aren't riding bikes is because they don't see other women like them doing it. And in these countries where you face like basically criminal consequences, women see other women doing yeah. it and they're like, I'm doing it too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of unimaginable to us. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And we really, I mean, I almost feel guilty and I feel like emotional whenever I hear these stories, cause I take for granted that I'm allowed to just do whatever I want. Essentially. I can just go out and ride my bike. I'm allowed to race. I'm allowed to just, I, I just take it for granted completely. And it makes me really sad that around the world like there are still places where you're getting faced with getting you know killed by by stoning if you ride a bike and you're a female yeah 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 it's 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 well it's like like i said it's kind of unimaginable and it's just so hard to understand that that mindset or not understand it but but you know we don't have to understand it it's completely wrong but the idea that there are people that really think like that um and unfortunately it's not just um afghanistan and saudi arabia it's the, iran as well and and um but you know i hope the, you know these are signs that potentially things are changing um but what i know from when from shannon's um uh time in the country um women's sport in Afghanistan, women's sport was becoming a bigger thing, whereas previously women had done almost no sport at all. Um, but cycling from her, um, from what people had told her, cycling was one of the last things um, 
to come because it was still so much that thing we were saying earlier where it was that association with women sitting on a saddle straddling a bicycle and this idea that that's a kind of it, it somehow feels to some people that it that's a sexualized position which is which is seems bizarre um but she she definitely felt that that was what many people were holding against bicycles specifically that it would that it would take your virginity in countries which is you know where that's still very much a kind of taboo um uh and yeah where virginity is highly prized um and the idea that sitting on a saddle might compromise that in some way um yeah man and we are unfortunately out of time and we didn't even get to talk about the history of women's racing and the first like professional oh, which, cyclists. Is, which is so yeah do you have which a couple so do you have amazing. a couple more minutes to talk about it yeah i mean yes of course where would you what would you um like, like to talk about like how, how did women's racing come to be and and like how did women become professional cyclists um well, when, when I say that the reason I wanted to write this book was to um, to, to make the history of cycling more representative, do do will certainly play a small role in helping make um, the history of cycling more look more representative um, and telling women stories that haven't been told um, or have been told, but um, you know haven't necessarily been um, acknowledged in the way they should be. Um, but there was also because my great grandfather was a um, he did bicycle racing in the 1890s um, and I was really curious. I'd seen pictures of him. I'd seen his medals and it felt like a very long time ago. That was the beginnings of when the bicycle became a really big thing. And I thought, well, I wonder if women were racing at this time. Um, I'd love to know that. Um, and it took me a while to to find out whether they had or not um and certainly where he raced um which is in london and uh, he he was a track cyclist so he raced in what is now is still a it's still there actually the Hernhill velodrome um it's a really famous british track um it took me a long time to find out if women had cycled there and and it turned out they had um but again like <laughs> like much of the history of women cycling is quite complicated um, because women had been um, not accepted, yeah, um, by the cycling authorities. Um, and they, so um, women, what I discovered was that women had raced and had been racing and they actually even raced, um, although I talked about women not riding high wheel bicycles, they had actually raced high wheel bicycles in North America. Um, and um, that was something that was completely um, really kind of blew me away. The idea of these women, like um, they raced horses, they raced other men. Um, but then cycling became much more professional sports um when the safety bicycle became a big thing um and women weren't allowed to race then um they were actually banned from most professional racing um certainly in north america um and so um but it didn't stop them um and so there were there was this amazing kind of troop of um in north america anyway of um safety bicycle racers, female safe bicycle racers, who um, raced on um, tracks that um, had been put up especially for them because they couldn't race in the established stadiums because, as I said, they weren't, they were banned by the Professional Cycling Association. Um, but in France, um, it was much more accepted for women to race on bicycles, so it was a, it was a much bigger thing. Um, and in the UK, um, they weren't banned from cycling, but it was, there was a kind of, um, they weren't exactly particularly welcome in the kind of the, the main velodromes. Um, but for a while, women's cycling racing in the 1890s did become quite a big thing and it became a big spectator sport. Um, but unfortunately, it kind of sort of died away a little bit um, in the early 1900s. Um, but 
I find it just absolutely fascinating reading about all these amazing characters, um, these women who had um, really become quite famous celebrities for their cycling. Um, and um, I discovered that their sort of their stories had been forgotten and, and some of their families didn't even know that they, that, that their ancestors had, had been these kind of um, amazing uh, female athletes um, who had won kind of incredible competitions and traveled to different countries um, and as I said were famous and used to do interviews in the press and um, had kind of fans across the country um, and that was just really fascinating to me that there was just this whole really early part of cycling history um, which women have been a really um, kind of big part of um, and it had generally not been remembered until um, recently some um, researchers and academics had 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 found out much more about this this incredible um, forgotten history early history of cycle racing um, but yes and then sort of yeah it went a little bit quiet for women cycling um, and then and then it came back again but but it's all throughout the 20th century it's been women kind of really struggling for recognition within professional cycling um and they weren't properly accepted um or you know their racing was never um acknowledged or recorded um until the late 1950s um even though women's races still happened they didn't happen in the same way that that men's races had it wasn't professionalized in the way that men's racing was um but it was the work of some again some really remarkable women who who got that got them to change and eventually they had world cycling championships for women um in the late 50s and that was kind of where things started to really change and women became part of professional cycling but if we um, also remember that women's cycling didn't happen in the Olympics till 1984, um, you realise how slow it was um, as a sport to change and, and upset women. That's a good cliffhanger for people because they can read the book to learn all of the details. And there's a lot of things that we didn't even have time to talk about. So can you say the book, <laughs> what the book is called and where people can find it? Um, so the book's called Revolutions, um, How Women Change the World in two wi on Two Wheels, um, and is available from all good bookshops, hopefully, and online, um, and also on audiobook. Yeah, Audible people and audiobook, I guess. And where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Um, I'm on Twitter, sort of intermittently, um, uh, at Hannah V Ross um, and also the same on Instagram again um, slightly intermittently and even more so off post baby <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, so I hope to uh, um, be a bit more active soon and also get back on my bike and have some more um, amazing cycling adventures because that's what I've been missing um for a while now so um looking forward to starting those again because that's mainly what I um Instagram about is my cycle trips you'll have cycle trips with um, baby so, yeah. that'll be inspiring for many yeah so many cycle trips with baby yeah, yeah. exactly awesome well thanks so much for yeah, coming on the show so thank awesome. you so much for having me